so uh, welcome everyone once again, and uh, we are also very delighted to be here and to be uh, invited by Vicky um, to give this presentation on our project, Queens of Humanities, Stories to Attract and Engage. This is actually the title of the uh, poster uh, we presented on um, Daria annual event in Athens last year. Um, but uh, we would like to uh, tell you a bit more about the development of the project because it's, um, there are a few changes since then, of course. And um, we would like to focus today on the question and maybe to um, engage you in some kind of a discussion on the topic on how to tell the story about humanities to make it more uh, appealing and more engaging uh, for um, others. Um, so, as uh, we were already uh, presented by Vicky, my name is Marta Świetlik and uh, my colleague, uh, Mag with my colleague Magdalena Vnok, we are um, uh, working together uh, in Digital Humanities Center uh, in Warsaw. Yeah, so I think I will uh, take it up, take it from here. And then, yes, you already know a little bit about us. Uh, you know that we are both humanists, uh, which is great, uh, taking into consideration what we are talking about today. However, I have been also been involved before. Uh, I had been involved in many uh, NGO uh, sector projects regarding advocacy, communications, lobbying, and this kind of stuff. So today, what we are actually going to talk about is this advocacy, so uh, advocacy for humanities. I'm taking this experience from the NGO sector and bringing to uh, academia, because actually what academia also needs is uh, more advocacy and more open advocacy. Okay, so what actually this advocacy uh, is? We can obviously define it as an activity or process of uh, supporting a cause and especially gaining public support uh, for our activity, our idea, our mission, any kind of a project that we are having. It can be, of course, individual. It can be, it can be done by a group. Obviously, advocacy is more, uh, usually more successful if it is done by a group. Okay, so uh, in the next slide, we will see uh, what our colleagues from uh, Advocacy Special Interest Group of Operas have prepared for us to better explain what uh, in what kind of uh, sphere we are actually in. So we have this whole communication uh, going on, uh, and the communication is the very is a very broad idea. We are all involved in communication some way. Then we have this advocacy, which actually is more about gaining public support for our cause, and it is a very very concrete and uh, well strategically planned, usually uh, public support gaining. We have this creation of central uh, positions. We have inclusion of public opinion in the in the creation of what we think and what we uh, believe in is what we believe is is important. And the last thing that we are having is uh, lobbying, which is uh, rather associated with uh, politics and influencing public officials. Influencing, influencing people in power. Actually, my last project in the NGO sector was called Transparent Lobbying, and it was involved, uh, and it, it was about uh, actually involving uh, politics uh, and politicians in Poland. So, as you can see, uh, my experience regarding at least analyzing what advocacy and lobbying and communication means uh, comes from uh, different uh, different contexts. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, what uh, what lobbying and uh, advocacy is about. Uh, and what we would like to do today is to discuss our, uh, firstly to discuss our campaign, Queens of Humanities, that we established in uh, November 2021. And it has, uh, it, it ended in June 2022, ju just after the, uh, the, the Adaria annual event, uh, during which we presented uh, the most important results of this campaign. Well, it's, it sounds, uh, you know, like it was a huge campaign of some kind, but actually it was not. It was our very uh, bottom, bottom up way of uh, bringing the attention of uh, our audiences in Facebook, uh, in Facebook of digital, in digital humanities, Facebook of our audiences to uh, innovative, specific projects that are going on in uh, humanities to show them also to show them both uh, Polish specific, you know, innovative 
a digital project, but also to show them some inspiration from, from the world. Uh, so uh, we posted circa 30 posts each. Uh, it was al always one post uh, a week, usually on Tuesdays. So it was well planned uh, in terms of uh, you know the calendar, uh, the, the Facebook calendar. And it usually, uh, whereas they were usually they were usually presenting firstly it was meant to be mo digital monographs born digital monographs but then it evolved and we showed a lot of different digital projects uh, and shared them with our audiences uh, we, we gathered all of the links on an online board and i think that marta will show you some uh, specific uh, examples uh, of the of the projects that we chose and what is important in the Queens of Humanities? Well, the, the campaign finished. Uh, we, we decided to finish it in June, but then it actually inspired us to, uh, to develop a strategy, an advocacy strategy that we, are, uh, that we are conducting right now. And we will talk, we will tell you a little bit about the strategy uh, later on after we show the examples of uh, Queens of Humanities. Because we believe that the inspiration that came from it was crucial for us to uh, to actually uh, formulate the mission that stands right now after, behind our all of our activities. Okay, so Marta, you can take on from here. Okay, so uh, Queens of Humanities was uh, kind of a gems gathering because we were trying to um, find out the most interesting. Um, projects, digital projects, uh, presenting uh, our outputs of uh, humanities research. Uh, now I would like to um, show you the responsive presentation of the project we presented, we created for Daria annual event, uh, because it's also kind of a innovative, so to say, um, way to present our uh, own um, uh, project. So uh, Queens of Humanity starts to attract and engage, was developed um, in terms of Digital Humanities Center, which is uh, based in uh, Institute of Literary Research, Polish Academy of Sciences, and it's also connected to with two uh, projects we are uh, currently working with, Triple, which is uh, about to finish, and um, Operas uh, PL, which is um, an expanding of national node of European research infrastructure um, in Poland. So we started with this um, with this question, why are humanities often underrated as a distant and less significant relative of scientific inquiry? Uh, which means we um, reflect on how humanities and um, STEAM, which uh, stands for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, why is it uh, ca um, usually recognized as less important, less appealing? We have a lot of uh, campaigns and a lot of um, popular um, projects um, showing uh, different outputs of of the uh, sciences but humanities uh, are often um, mistaken i would say as uh, not as a valuable knowledge production but rather as um, kind of um, uh, not so uh, interesting and not so innovative in a way but we believe that humanities have an impact on many aspects of life and we were trying to um, convince our audiences on Facebook and um, and around uh, and mostly our Polish uh, community um, by showing some examples for uh, like you can see the um, comic books or video games that are um, more okay. Sorry, that are more um, interesting ways to show, uh, but in fact they are based on uh, humanistic uh, research. So uh, the most important, um, uh, yeah, you can see how to bring the, the humanities back to the table as an equal partner of sciences. And here is our Facebook campaign. Uh, there is the uh, main. Um, image we uh, shared with our uh, audience there. Uh, I can say uh, a bit more um, uh, in a moment. 
about this. Uh, we decided to um, do this campaign every Tuesday on our Facebook page. And as uh, Magda said earlier, we started in November and and finished in uh, June. But um, it is important that it also boosted our reach uh, on Facebook. Uh, so this is how it looks like, mainly. And uh, yeah, there are a few examples of most popular posts by Rich, of course. Uh, the first one, uh, the most popular at the time was a series of online uh, tutorials uh, on how to create innovative outputs in humanity. So uh, just to jump in, yeah. I think it's it's it was done by Daria. I think yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's the, yeah. those were the Daria materials. So yeah, they were very popular. Yeah. So, as you can see, many of our uh, users are interested in uh, learning process and uh, in um, using some uh, online materials. Uh, there was also this digital atlas of Ukrainian history because also our campaign um, somehow entwined with the um, boost on um, information about Ukrainians and the crisis of uh, war there. Uh, and there was also this therapeutic stories for Ukrainian children seeking refuge in Poland, which was created by one of the Polish um, institutes. And um, yeah, it was also very, uh, very interesting and very popular, especially uh, around the time of the uh, war. So, uh, yeah, this is the um, explanation of the title. So, Queens of Humanities, and um, actually the, the name came from the insight of previous research, which was um, uh, conducted uh, a bit earlier. Uh, one of the responders in the um, interview said that uh, monograph, like printed book, is kind of a queen of uh, humanities, a coronation of the um, research process um, that is taken in humanities. Um, and we um, were trying to uh, a bit... Um, uh, move it to more uh, digital form, which means new queens of humanities are those digital um, uh, media, uh, like games, like uh, virtual reality, uh, some applications, uh, online uh, apps and, and um, other um, internet forms. And uh, it was a mean of uh, advocacy, of course. Uh, it can be we hope it can be an inspiring for uh, others uh, uh, and can be somehow um, moved to uh, other um, other communities as well. Uh, here are also some examples like historical video games, this War of Mine, which is Polish, um, a Polish project, very uh, well recognized. And actually it was uh, right now um, taken to uh, one of the, um, it, it's mandatory in schools as a, um, as a learning um, example. So uh, children in Polish schools are uh, playing the game to get to know the uh, different aspects of history, uh, especially from the perspective of uh, civilians, not only the uh, soldiers. And this is the therapeutic storybook for Ukrainian children, which was actually a printed book, but it was also um, available online for those who cannot uh, access the, the book. So uh, the main idea was to create something simple and content related. Uh, it would it can be therefore uh, easily applied for other local communities. Facebook's posts uh, are quite recognizable, at least uh, in Poland. So um, I think uh, it can be also used on other social media platforms as well. So. The idea was to tell the right story, to, to tell the story about humanities that is um, influential, powerful, and it's a vit vital component of human activity. And as Magda said already, we gathered it on online board uh, in uh, Arena um, platform. Um, so this is most about, uh, yeah, here is the... Um, 
image we were taken. This is the queen, uh, which was our our main figure. This is Polish queen Jadwiga. She's from uh, 14th century, and she's one of the very few in the history of Polish royal royalties uh, that serve as uh, rightfully crowned ruler. Uh, she's here portrayed by a uh, famous Polish master, Jan Matejko, uh, in the time of uh, creating Polish uh, identity during the absence of Polish state on the map of Europe. And uh, this picture is uh, mostly printed in school books in Poland. So we took this uh, old um, old figure uh, to be our guide and to make uh, the... Um, the story about uh, humanity is more uh, recognizable and more familiar, so to say. And uh, it was not only about monographs, it was about living books, digital monographs, and other innovative forms of publications, which you can see here. Uh, I gathered a few examples. More of them are on the Arena. I can show you now the Arena um, platform, which is an uh, open source platform for um gathering some inspirations uh, here we have all of them yeah and it serves as an archive as well because someone asked uh, this question yeah so this is kind of a web archive for us but we plan on developing it right right now but then maybe we'll tell a little bit more about it later. yes uh exactly and uh, so you are also welcome to, to find us on Arena. Uh, and here are a few examples we want to uh, emphasize. Uh, I can start with this um, Chinese Deathscape project, uh, which is... Um, which is published by a Stanford University Press. And uh, as you can see, uh, it also... Um, it was edited by Thomas Maloner, uh, who is professor of Chinese history at Stanford University. And it has been assigned uh, I I ISBN uh, because it was firstly published as a traditional book containing three chapters. And here uh, you have those three chapters um, presented in the form of a uh, web. Uh, site and uh, if you click on um, certain chapters you can see how um, it features an uh, augmented narrative platform so to say so maybe to make it more uh, understandable for you uh, there are a few overlays you can choose from uh, like demographic overlay uh, and maybe to see the words uh, this is how you can you can um, you can use it. Uh, anytime you see an underlined passage of text, uh, you can click on it to reposition the map and to see direct links to certain points. Uh, as the story, the the text is about. Um, graves and relocations of graves in uh, Chinese in different uh, time uh, of, of um, uh, in, in different times. So uh, user is invited to choose different combination of those base layers or demographic overlayers or historic overlayers. Uh, they're connected to those three chapters, as I mentioned. And uh, there's also this uh, drop down menu here. Um, and uh, in addition to clicking on the text, you can also interact with the map directly by clicking on the grave. And then you can see some details of it. When you uh, click on the circle, a window is open containing further information. And it's also possible to navigate the data set using the time slider. Uh, so this is a great example of how traditional humanistic output, which is, as I mentioned, usually uh, presented in a form of printed monograph, could be translated into a more interactive digital project. And uh, it's not only um, make it more appealing, but also it deepened the understanding of the sub subject with the usage of, of the map, which is the most uh, important point um, here. 
So this is uh, one of the uh, examples. And uh, another one uh, is the Lost Treasures. It's a Ukrainian project, actually, which is also quite interesting to showing during uh, to show it during the um, crisis, uh, war crisis in in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, this is developed as part of the Ukrainian Everyone program run by the Ukrainian Institute, and it tells the story of Ukraine's contribution to the world culture through online uh, interactive projects, as you can see here. Mm. It's a project about uh, five Ukrainian women artists living and working in the 1960s. Um, it's very visually appealing narrative and it has, uh, from the lives and works of those extraordinary women, uh, who changed the world around them and who refused to submit to the stereotypes of Soviet art. And as you can see, it's a kind of traditional, so to say, presentation where, uh, you can see the mm, figure of uh, certain artists and the biography with some animated elements very uh, in a way it's very traditional uh, way of the um, art history uh, research right to find out some history and to show it through the works and uh, the biography but in addition we also have here a very simple but appealing uh, game that is clicked and collect. I don't know if you can hear the sound, but there is also a sound. So it's like a video game. Yeah, way. exactly. Okay, maybe we can jump to another example. Yeah, and here you can choose colors. Yes, and this is actually animated uh, work of one of the artists. It's a painting that is um, showed as a bug of the character. Yeah, and then you can see some other images. Yeah, and then we have another and another artist. Yeah, so there is the story of them being part of the um, uh, Soviet time and and. Um, how they not only how they were active uh, as an artist but also as some kind of activist uh for the time so uh this is something that is very open for um for uh, users and uh, it's based on the research of art historian but it's realized in very unconventional way with a focus on on fun and uh, this user center approach uh, I would say so. This is the second example, a bit more advanced than the first. I would I would say, um, and the third example we would like to show is something um, very um, 
unconventional, I would say, uh, Digital Love Languages. It is a project and um, uh, it was a 10-week uh, online course taught by Melanie Hoff at the School of Poetic Computation based in New York, which is a hybrid of a school, artist residency and some research group where students um, develop a deep curiosity about what it means to work poetically in computational me uh, media. So it covers the basic of programming uh, and natural language processing using Python and JavaScript uh, in a browser. And at the same time, it's uh, treating code as a craft and a medium capable of expressing uh, a full range of feelings uh, and desires. Uh, so as a result of this project, they uh, the, the course, they developed this um, kind of uh, web zine which is very unlinear and uh, very um, unconventional in a way of showing results. Here you can move uh, not only uh, horizontally, but also, um, yeah, so both horizontally and um, up down. And uh, yeah, there are some, um, out, uh, some inputs from students and some kind of uh, poetry uh, made in a code. Uh, so here the technology is understood as a social process and uh, it is a pretext for considering digital love languages uh, became the history of love letters as a linguistic form in all its manifestations. So from, um, yeah, it's based on communication and, and digital at the same time. And this, the, the form is also very uh, interesting to see as it's uh, something that uh, you cannot uh, be sure what is the chronology of, of this um, inputs, but you can see it, yeah, like love letters and in the same time, some more, um, more uh, today's media social media and yeah and it's collective it's non hierarchical uh, collection of materials projects and ephemera created over 10 weeks and uh, it can be browsed by clicking on individual uh, unspecified elements scattering across the sky so you're welcome also to to um to see more of it okay yeah, and uh, I would just uh, end up with this, that the main insight from the project Queens of uh, Humanities was that developing novel methods uh, of measuring humanities' impact on social life and economy is crucial to strengthen its place uh, because uh, it's not uh, fully understandable how the impact is um, measured now and how it's um, underrated somehow. Yeah, so exactly. This is uh, the examples are wonderful, and we we know that in many parts of the world uh, those this kind of projects appear, but many times uh, in terms of uh, evaluative systems they are not appreciated and they are not uh, rated as high as they should be. So we decided on the that this is actually a starting point for for our advocacy project. We would like to concentrate obviously on the Polish. Polish academic community, but then again, this 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 these actions that we are taking uh, are scalable, and everyone you know can get inspired and somehow uh, take our examples and maybe take our experience, maybe a little bit learn from it, uh, so to say, and uh, try to implement uh, similar uh, actions in in their country. But yes, so. What did we learn from the Queens of Humanities? Uh, as I said, it actually inspired inspire us for, a, uh, for formulating a mission that stands behind our actions. And the mission is to make humanities great again. And this is actually the mission to make humanities uh, great again. Uh, mission is something that, that is also used by us in our social media uh, uh, communication. So we know that the humanities are very important but that they are often perceived through a prism of many stereotypes. We also know that within the disciplines, there are many innovative ways 
there are many solid studies uh, that are presented in uh, innovative outputs, but it is, it is important to make them more accessible and more attractive to wide audiences, because many times people just never know that they exist and they just uh, are, you know, recognized by a very small uh, amount of people. So we want to, firstly, we, want, we would like to continue with the Queens of Humanities uh, mission and to share them and promote them as, uh, as we can. But we also uh, actually developed a, a new advocacy strategy, uh, strategy for uh, publishers. So we would like to address not only the audiences that, okay, we know that there are many interesting projects and the audiences should know about them, but we also would like the publishers to know how to share their uh, innovative projects better and how to share their publications better. So we've started with uh, open monographs. This is something that we believe is a first step uh, to make uh, humanistic uh, outputs more accessible. We know that the journals are becoming more and more accessible, but we have still a lot of problems with monographs, which are usually printed in very, uh, very, uh, very small amounts. Okay, so Marta, if you could show the next slide, yeah. So this is uh, a very, very simple flowchart for our strategy development. So we started, uh, yeah, we started as collectors of uh, Queens of Humanities, of the projects that we have shown to you. Then uh, after, uh, after we gathered a lot of them, we understood that actually we need more ways, uh, more methods to empower the humanities. And then uh, we, we decided to design a long-term strategy project that will, uh, that, will be con that will focus on publishers and authors because they, they work together, so they both need to know why it is so important to make their uh, efforts accessible, open, uh, in the digital world as, as shareable as possible. And then we, we decided that to make the publishers and the authors more willing to uh, actually collaborate with us, uh, we need to change the evaluative system of how the digital works are, uh, are rated right now. So yeah, there are four steps of the strategy and we are in on the third one, uh, I guess, uh, of the flowchart. So yeah, we, we actually uh, managed to uh, uh, to uh, to get the funding uh, for this project. We have projects since uh, September 2022, and it will end in 2024. And we believe that, yeah, this uh, two-year time will help us build a community uh, in Poland between, uh, of course, not all of the publishers, but at least maybe we'll be able to create a coalition of publishers that will be willing to uh, implement some, uh, some tools to better uh, manage their um, the editorial system and in general uh, uh, the way how they publish uh, open monographs and how they uh, participate in open science and open humanities as we call it uh, and then we believe that we will be able to take those examples and together with the publishers and the authors as a coalition we will be able to go to the ministry uh, of the polish state and discuss uh, the changes in the evaluative uh, program and system. And yes, this strategy was actually also published uh, during a conference in uh, Norway, uh, the Munich Conference on Open Science. Uh, so here you can see uh, how we started from the mission to empower humanities as an open and impactful scholarly field. Then we uh, defined our audiences. Uh, we, yeah, we, we tried to uh, get the funding and we actually uh, did succeed in it. Uh, we know about the risks, so we decided to um, to construct the whole project using agile methods. So we took some methods from the uh, from IT, from IT management, and uh, we try to implement them and inspire, be inspired by them during the whole management management uh, management process. Then we have our primary goals and milestones. As as I said. Uh, we mostly concentrate on publishing. So we, you, we have those uh, open access models for publishing monographs, but we also have obviously uh, scholarly communication in the Polish community. We know that people need more competences uh, in terms of how open communication uh, should look like, what are the tools, what are the trends, 
what is actually uh, feasible and what is not feasible in their own disciplines. Then we have uh, methods. So we have, uh, right now we are working on design thinking methods with publishers, but then the, the second, the mo most important methods, I guess, is the agile management. So trying to uh, learn from it iteratively. So what, when we do something, for instance, it lasts like two months, then we try to think over whether, what worked, what did not work, and then adjust uh, our next steps uh, according to uh, to what we done, what we have done previously. And it is, uh, yeah, and as I said, it's not like we do it uh, every every year or every two year. This kind of evaluation of our methods, we try to do it much more often. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is the uh, the, the steps uh, that are uh, implemented that will be implemented during uh, our uh, project. So firstly, we build collaborations among publishing houses, and that's why we chose the design thinking methods to make them more engaged. We believe that this is the problem, that the publishers think they know everything and that they know what they need, but then when they meet with others, they see that the problems, they overlap, but the solutions are actually various, and we don't, have, we don't know yet what the best solution is. So then uh, we will obviously foster uh, communication among humanities researchers. So this is what I was saying about the competences, the knowledge about open uh, communication. Uh, then we hope to reach decision makers uh, with some results uh, of our actions this year and the next year we are going to, to reach the decision makers. And then hopefully we will at least uh, create a project of the changes uh, of the evaluation in Poland how the, the innovative uh, scholarly outputs are evaluated. Yeah, so this is the plan for the next uh, next a year and a half, and what, what will be next, we don't know yet. But it all started with the Queens of Humanities uh, project uh, as a, you know, collector's project to, to just gather some interesting examples and to share them on Facebook. And right now we are actually dealing with real stuff, uh, which is the evaluation system that we are hoping to change. Okay, but actually what we wanted to, uh, you know, to boost the discussion about was how to tell the story of your research. So we would like to know what, what are your methods, what are your ideas for uh, sharing and making your research more attractive, accessible, um, yeah, and appealing to audience. Yeah, so we will leave you with this bigger question. Uh and see if, if you have any, any thoughts on that. Mm -hmm.